God's uh, providential hand and care was upon us, I would just say that our five or six days in London uh, was superintended by the goodness and the kindness of God, just rewarding, it seemed like, every single step of the journey. Uh, and uh, of course, one of the highlights was a Sunday morning, uh, being able to worship at Westminster Abbey. And the very first song that comes on with the organs is, uh, oh God, our help in ages past. And uh, just listen, transport me to glory right now. That's, uh, that's all I needed in that moment. But uh, you have not lived life until you've had Rick as a travel buddy. So what a great time uh, it was with Pastor Rick. <laughs> well, take uh, your Bibles, turn to Amos chapter nine uh, today. We're going to wrap up the sermon series in Amos, and it's a glorious chapter. Of course, it will speak of destruction and sifting and shaking, but it will end with restoration and promise of renewal and hope, and so I am looking forward to this passage today. <coughs> but first, a story. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, a company. Maybe you've heard of companies like this. Uh, the company was struggling for a long time. Uh, it was headed in a downward uh, direction. Morale was at an all-time low. Expenses were at an all-time high. Uh, uh, conversations around the coffee pot were in hushed tones uh, as employees would oftentimes criticize the leadership or complain about coworkers. Uh, listen, everyone knew that there were problems in the company and everyone seemed to be an expert on how to fix those problems but nobody had the courage to face the pain that would require to make the changes necessary. Uh, because some of you are familiar with changes in companies, how delicate and tricky it can be, right? That if you fire this person, that person will get upset. If you promote this person, that person will complain. If you restructure this area, this area will experience layoffs. So it's very tricky. Uh, well, everyone knew changes need to be made. Nobody was willing to endure the process, and so therefore everything continued to suffer and head in a wrong direction until word came, word came, a new owner had come into town and bought the company. And at first there was so much excitement and enthusiasm. Finally, the company could kind of turn the corner and grow, but that enthusiasm was met with uh, just the stark reality that as soon as changes were made, oh, the pain was being felt through the corporation. Sure enough, this person was promoted, that person complained. This person was let go, that person did. This was restructured and there was layoffs in this area. And all of a sudden, everybody's like, man, we liked it the way it was before. Uh, the changes to the company all of a sudden took an employee staff of 50 down to 10. And after about a year, people were thinking, man, we liked it the way it once was. At first, all of the changes to the organization made it feel like the company was worse than before. But sure enough, sure enough, after about a year or so, the company began to turn a better direction. Growth began to come back. Morale began to grow. And all of the changes that they were making all of a sudden helped the company. If you were to ask those 10 employees who actually stayed with the company long enough to endure the changes and endure the seasons, those 10, that little remnant of 10 people would have said, listen, all of us knew that changes need to be made. None of us wanted to go through the pain, but we're sure glad we did it. It calls to mind this idea of a sifting, okay? A sifting process uh, where growth requires sifting. So I want to take that analogy and give you Amos chapter 9. Here is the sermon in one sentence. The sermon in a sentence. The path of growing is always accompanied by a process of sifting. Say it with me, would you? The path of growing is always accompanied by a process of sifting. Some of you at this moment in life are in a sifting process. In fact, I would say, I would contend that our globe is in a sifting process. Uh, and, and all of us maybe recognize in our lives areas of change that need to happen, areas of change that we want to happen, but yet we're not willing to endure the pain or to go through the difficulties to see those changes come about. And so we kind of head in the same direction, doing the same things over and over, all the while knowing that there's things that the Lord may indeed want to change. Listen, the path of growing always is accompanied by the process of sifting. If you are experiencing a sifting process, a shaking process right now in your life, you're 
in good company because the Lord puts us in a sifting process to produce the changes that he wants to make. Do you have a child going through a sifting process? Do you have a grandchild going through a sifting process? Do you, do you see the tumultuous nature? Because what is true for that company is the same thing true for a nation, it's the same thing true for a church, and it's true for you personally. Here it is, once again, the path of growing is always accompanied by the process of sifting. And guess what, church? That process of sifting is not a fun process. The scripture talks about it in other languages or other language like this, uh, pruning. Who likes pruning? Not many people, because at first when you prune something, it looks worse than it did before, but it's only through the pruning process that, it, that the tree can flourish to abundance and growth, and the same is true of our lives, which is why I prayed for you at the start. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the, what is it? For you know that the, the testing, there it is, the testing of your faith, the, sh the sifting, the, the pruning, you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. New Hope, James chapter 1, verse 2, calls this truth to mind. The path of growing is always accompanied by the process of sifting. For that, we turn to Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 9 is going to present that for us because God is going to deal with the nation of Israel and he's gonna put them through a sifting process. New Hope, it's a process that would begin 2,700 years ago, and it's a process that would continue through the centuries, and we are going to now, in this passage, witness before our very eyes the fulfillment of God's promises to Amos in our own lifetime. This passage of scripture, Amos chapter nine, follows a long trajectory of how God is going to deal with his people. His people have been stubborn. They've resisted change for generations. And finally, the Lord has come to them and said, enough is enough. And so here we have, we're gonna kind of recap. If you're brand new with us, this will be the last time that we kind of recap uh, the book of Amos for you to find out why we are at where we are at in chapter nine. So here it is, the Lord says, enough is enough. It began in chapter one and two. The lion roars from Zion, chapter one, verse two. And what is the Lord roaring about? Well, the dreadful reality is that there's so much sin and corruption among the nations and among his people that the Lord roars and says, enough is enough. This book is a message to the people of Israel specifically. And so the lion roars. What does the lion say? Well, we get that word in chapter three, four, and five. Hear this word, O Israel. Hear this word, you cows. Remember? Hear this word, O Israel. And the word is a dire warning. Chapter three, here's the warning. Trouble is coming. You better wake up. And what a great message for our day today. As trouble continues to brew, church, it is time to wake up, get your heads out of the sand, and recognize that there's trouble in the world, and yet God is sovereign, and he is at work. Trouble is brewing. Time to wake up. Chapter 5. The difficult problem that the Lord addresses is that the people of God love to sin. Oh, well, that's a problem. They love the sin, and so the Lord allows them to experience the consequences of their actions over and over and over again. They sin, they suffer. 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 There you go. Five times, yet you didn't return to me. So the difficult problem is you guys aren't paying attention. It led to the divine solution. Chapter six, seek the Lord and live. Seek the Lord and live. That message actually out of chapter five was that grand invitation by the Lord God of the universe. It was true then, it's true now, and it's an invitation to you today, seek the Lord and live. Because God promises in his word, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me, what? With all of your heart, are you seeking him? It is that persistence to seek the Lord. That's the divine solution for you, church. That's the divine solution for us. We have a good and kind and gracious God who in his long suffering, he invites you to seek him. And if you seek him, you'll live. Well, Israel said, forget that. We don't wanna do that, which led to the devastating rebuke. Chapter six or chapter five and six, here is a devastating rebuke. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It was a message of woes as the Lord was confronting them. 
here it is, for their complacency. They're at ease in Zion, laying on their beds, drinking their wine, partying it up, and they think that they're in some lofty position so as to remain untouchable as a nation. And the Lord says, let me, let me take you on a road trip through history. Let me take you through history and show you all of the empires who were where you were at, thinking you were untouchable, and I brought them down from their lofty position. And the devastating rebuke that the Lord gives is you are at ease and complacent, but you don't understand that destruction is coming to you. Is that a good warning for today or what? It's a deeply needed warning, the devastating rebuke that pride leads to downfall. Here we have now the last three chapters. Chapter seven was a dangerous direction. A series of visions. Amos begins to experience a, se a season of, of the Lord revealing where the future is headed for Israel. Vision number one, locusts are gonna come and devour the land. And he pleads, oh Lord, please forgive. How can, how can Jacob stand? He's so small. Have you, by the way, have you ever stopped to just consider how small the nation of Israel is? So when, when he's pleading with God, oh Lord, please forgive, how can Judah stand against your wrath? He's so small, he just, he's so tiny. This little bitty land, which is really no bigger than from like Elk Rapids to Cadillac. I mean, the, isn't that fascinating that this little tiny land is the focal point of history? And so the Lord relents. Amos intercedes and the Lord relents, okay? No destruction there, but I'm gonna send fire instead. Oh, thanks God, that's great. Vision two, I'm gonna send fire and it's gonna destroy the land. Amos intercedes, oh Lord, please cease. How can, Amos, or how can uh, Judah stand? He's so small. And so the Lord once again relents, delays his disaster because God is patient, not desiring any should perish. And so third vision, plumb line. Amos, take the plumb line in your hand and go into the midst of the people. Take it to the capitals, take it to the houses and take my plumb line. What is that? the vertical truth of God by which you are to measure the nation. You're to examine the nation. You're to hold out that plumb line and say, thus says the Lord. Well, how did Israel respond to the plumb line of truth? Much like our nation does today, that rejects it, scorns it, it's very hostile to it. They attack Amos, they threaten to kick him out of the nation. And my friend, all of that was in chapter seven. Israel is headed in a dangerous direction because they are rejecting the truth of God's word. And so God says in chapter eight, dark judgment. They are ripe for judgment. Take a look at it, chapter eight, verse one, and you will see the picture there. The vision is a basket of ripe fruit. Amos is like, well, what's that all about? The Lord says, my nation is ripe for judgment. That's where they're headed which leads us finally now into this chapter nine, a daring rescue. New Hope, just now we're brought up to speed. Listen, consider this. If Israel will be saved, it will be saved because of the goodness and kindness of a God who comes to rescue them out of their sin. Because the people refuse to turn and seek the Lord and live. And it's the same today. If people will be rescued, they will be rescued because of the goodness and kindness of a God who comes to our aid and rescues us because we in our own flesh are bound for destruction. Take a look at chapter nine, verse one. In your Bibles, especially if you have an ESV, uh, there's a title above chapter nine, verse one, and it says something like this. It says, the destruction of Israel. Do you see that? Whoa. Whoa. Is that applicable for today or what? As people around our globe are chanting and cheering for the destruction of Israel, this passage is extremely relevant for today. Let's get into it, okay? Here we go. God shakes his house. God shakes his house. Take a look at chapter nine, verse one, and you will see that God is about to shake his house. I saw the Lord standing by the altar, he says, and the Lord specifically says this. He says, strike the capitals until the thresholds shake and shatter them on the heads of all the people. Now, this is remarkable, friend, because the Lord God is declaring war against his own people. He's warning of the destruction of Israel. 
And that is the message that is being resounded around this globe as some people are crying out against the nation of Israel and actually chanting for their destruction. Let me give you an illustration. We landed in London at 10 a.m. on Saturday. This is the last week ago. Uh, by the time we got downtown at about uh, right around 2 p.m., what we didn't realize was that London was the center of a global day of protest where they estimate over 300,000 people that were protesting the very existence of Israel. And so there Rick and I are wandering our way through the streets of London, and here's the, some of the images that we're witnessing before us as people are marching and chanting against the Zionists, against this, calling out for the destruction of Israel. Guys, from like 2 p.m. all the way to the wee hours of the morning, right outside of our hotel, this is going on. Everything you read about was like right in our face as people are cheering and chanting against the very existence of Israel. One of the most striking examples right outside of our hotel, on the corner was a mob of protesters who were gathered outside of a jewelry store owned by a Jewish man. It was called Heim Jewelers, intent on destroying the business were it not for London police who stood in front of it. And I'm thinking, man, the scripture is like unfolding before our eyes. But here, take a look at chapter 9, verse 1. The destruction of Israel is actually being announced by the God who founded Israel. Now this is kind of remarkable to me, is that the God who built the house is now the God who is going to shake the house. He says, strike the capitals all the way down to the thresholds. What is God doing? Well, church, listen, the path of growing is always accompanied by the process of sifting. And the Lord is going to shake his house to get the attention of his people in order to preserve a remnant for his possession. But it is this that God declares war. In the next passage of scripture, what we see, verse two, is that Israel's in trouble, guys. Israel's in trouble. In fact, by the way, uh, after witnessing all of those hours uh, on the streets of London, Pastor Rick says to me, man, London's in trouble. And to this passage, I would say, New Hope, listen, Amos chapter nine, Israel's in trouble because God has set his face against them. Verse four, I have set my face, look at, I set my eyes against them to do evil to them, not good. And in verses two and three, the Lord is warning the people about something. And this is fascinating in scripture uh, because uh, the people of Israel at this time, they knew the scriptures. They knew the Psalms, which had been written for 200 plus years before this moment. And one of the great Psalms rejoices in the presence of Almighty God, who promises to never leave them or forsake them. Let me tell you about it. Psalm chapter 139, uh, David asks a rhetorical question. Where can I go from your spirit? And some of you know the answer. Uh, if I go up to heaven, what? You're there. If I go to Sheol, you're there. If I go to the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Okay, got it? Got it? That's Psalm 139. That psalm was intended to give comfort and assurance that the ever-present God who is ever for me is always with me. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Take a look at verse two and three. Now Amos turns that passage on its head to give this warning. The ever-present God who is ever with you is now ever against you. Uh-oh, and guess what? You can't get away from him. Look what it says. He says, if I go down to Sheol, uh-oh, I'm gonna go get him. If you go up to heaven, I'm gonna come get you. If you try to hide on the top of Mount Carmel, I'm gonna come get you. If you go to make your bed in the depths of the sea, I'm gonna send a serpent to bite you. If you go into exile among your foreigners, even there I'm gonna kill you with a sword. My friends, how cool is it that God is for us, not against us, first of all, right? But how terrifying a reality to think that there's this God of the universe that you can't get away from and he's against you. Israel's in trouble. What's gonna happen? Well, verse five through seven, it's a reminder that God is in charge. They think that they're, they're at ease, they're complacent in Zion, but he reminds them, I am the one in charge of the nations with fantastic poetic imagery in verse five and six. And there's a reminders that this God of the universe, if he simply speaks a command or touches the earth, the earth will melt. 
uh, with one verbal command, he can raise one nation up and cause another nation to fall. And then in verse seven, look at how it ends. Uh, up. I've said it before, but this is one of those passages that in your private devotions, if you read it, you're just like, okay, that just is weird. It doesn't make sense. And you just kind of move on, right? Right? right. Okay. I, I thought I was alone in that. But verse seven, the intent is to communicate that God is in charge of the placement of the nations, the rise and the fall. And notice who he calls attention to. Did I not cause Israel to come out of Egypt? Did I not bring the Philistines and put them out of where they're at to where they're at? Did I not bring Syria to where they're at? New Hope, the three people groups that he lists, Israel, the Philistines, and Syria are still the focal point of human history. You've seen the map before, and here's the map again. And what he's, saying, what he's saying is that, did I not put Israel here? Did I not put the Philistines right here? What were the Philistine cities? Ashdod, Ashkelon, and here's their capital, Gaza. Did I not put Israel here? Did I not put the Philistines there? Did I not put Syria there? Oh my word, new hope, surprise, God's in charge. And it's a reminder to the people of Israel. It's a reminder, guys, the Lord who put you here is going to be the Lord who exiles you because he's in the sifting process. He's in the sifting business. And the Lord is about to shake his house. The good news is that when God shakes his house, he has redemptive purposes in mind. Let's move to an action step. Action step, get your house in order. Get your house in order. God's first order of business is to shake his house and prepare a holy remnant. The scripture is clear on this. New Testament church, listen, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. 1 Peter 4, 17, uh, Peter is very clear that God has an order of business by which he goes about bringing his word into the world. And here's what 1 Peter chapter 4 says. 1 Peter 4 says this, for it is time for judgment to begin, to begin, think of it, at the, what? The household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? New Hope, this is why I say, get your house in order. Because when the Lord uh, looks upon the world, his first order of business is to shake his house. For what purpose? For the purpose of raising up a holy remnant. He shakes his house so as to, as, as to separate the wheat from the chaff. He shakes his house in order to wake up the church. This is God's aim. Uh, his aim is that a sleepy church would wake up, that a corrupted church would become blameless, that, uh, that a wayward church would become focused. Uh, this is his focus. So get your house in order. Get your house in order. I believe as I look around the nation right now, uh, from, from coast to coast across America, including northern Michigan, it is very apparent to me that God is shaking his house, and it's not all bad, by the way. We are witnessing, yes, some people falling away from the faith. We're witnessing entire denominations running away from the truth of the gospel. However, what is happening in the midst of the shaking process is we are witnessing the holy remnant beginning to wake up and recognize that there is bigger things at stake. And what is the remnant doing? They are finding the true church of Jesus Christ where the gospel is proclaimed. And so in the midst of the shaking of God's house, yes, there's falling away, but there is a resurrection, as it were, of the body of Jesus Christ as the people of God are coming back and waking up to the realities in our world. So I would say, and I invite you, get your house in order. What would that look like in your life? Uh, right now, perhaps there's a shaking going on within your home, a shaking and a sifting within your family. And I think part of it is to recognize, okay, God, what are your purposes? Because... If, in fact, the path of growing is always accompanied with the process of sifting, then, Lord, what do you want to sift? What do you want to change in my life? It puts each one of us at a crossroads where we have to ask the question, what is God shaking? What does God want to change? And what are the purposes that he wants to develop in my life? 
action step number one, get your house in order. Because Peter says judgment begins with the household of God. In Amos chapter nine, this is what's taking place, is that God shakes his house. And now we have the imagery, and he does some sifting. Take a look with me. What is God going to do with his people? Verse eight. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom. That's quite a description of Israel, isn't it? A sinful, the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the surface of the ground. Whoa. Is there any hope? Thank you. <laughs> Except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. It is a promise of a remnant. So here we have the passage of scripture. Flow with me. Here we go. God declares war. Israel's in trouble. God's in charge. And the Lord says, you can't go anywhere except I'm going to find you. And my eyes are set against you for evil. Is there any hope? I don't know. What does verse 8 say? Oh, here it is. I'm going to utterly destroy Israel except, except I will not completely destroy the household of Jacob. What is he saying? He's saying that I'm going to preserve a remnant, a small remnant for my possession. And the Lord is doing this, by the way, because he made a promise to Israel through Abraham that I will establish your household and you, the Jewish people, would be a blessing to the nations. My friend, God is in the business of preserving every promise he has ever made. And so he says, I'm going to preserve this remnant. Well, how is the Lord going to preserve the remnant when so much evil is, is around? How, do, how does the Lord bring up forth that remnant out of all of the destruction? He does it through sifting. Look with me at verse 9, probably the key passage. Verse 9 says it this way. For behold, I will command and shake the house of Israel among all the nations as one shakes with a, what? Sieve. But no pebble shall fall to the earth. It's a picture. Picture, picture, picture. Why? Because the Lord loves to communicate in pictures so we understand what he's saying. And the picture is a sieve, which we don't use that word very often, but we do use the word colander or strainer or filter. Picture it like this. A miner who's looking for gold puts a bunch of stuff in that sifter and vigorously shakes it looking for gold. Or a kid at the beach in South Florida will put a bunch of sand in a, a, a shaker or filter and will shake it vigorously to find seashells. Or a chef at Thanksgiving will put a bunch of stuff in a strainer and shift it around vigorously. Why? To drain out the bad and to keep the good. And what the Lord is saying is that I'm going to put my people into a sieve and I'm going to shake them vigorously. For what purpose? Here it is. So that all of the evil will be drawn away. They will fall to the earth, verse 10. They will fall to the earth and be destroyed. But guess what's going to be kept in the basket? The remnant, verse 9. Here it is, the remnant. Not one pebble, not one not one, my friend, will fall to the ground. Why? Because, oh, we have a faithful God who has promised to preserve a remnant for his glory. And Jesus would go on to say this, come unto me, he would say, or he would say, uh, all that the Father has given me will come to me, and all that the Father gives me I will never cast out. He holds us in his hand. New hope, that is the preserving power of a gracious God who saves us to the uttermost, who doesn't lose one of all who come to him. Like little pebbles in his hand, we are safe. In the midst of all of the sifting and shaking and vigorousness of the world and all the tumultuousness, yes. Is there sifting around the world? Yep. Is there shaking going on? Yes. What is God doing? He is separating the wheat from the chaff. There is a great sifting going on in the church. There's a great sifting going on in the world. And all that is evil is fading away. 
but in the end of all days, what we will find is that the Lord is faithful to be holding a remnant of which you are a part if you are a follower of Jesus the Christ. God's purposes prevail. So what can we do in the midst of all of the shaking? In the midst of a world that is just tumultuousness? Well, one thing we can do is this, action step. We can pass on unshakable faith. We can take this unshakable faith of an unshakable kingdom and we can pass it on. As God shakes the nation, our grandkids will need our unshakable foundation of faith. One of the key things that you and I can do, one of the key things that old people like me and older people like you can do, <laughs> is to take our unshakable faith and pass it on to the next generation. We can make an investment in those little pebbles. And that's what our grandkids are, they're just little pebbles. They're, they're, they're little pebbles held in the gracious hand of God. Some of them right now wandering, some of them prodigal, some of them wavering, some of them being sifted as we speak. And yet what we do is that we, we advocate for them before the throne of God above and also we train them, we teach them, we come alongside of children for the sake of our grandchildren and we invest and we take our unshakable faith in an unshakable kingdom and we demonstrate what it looks like to remain standing firm in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. That's what we do. One of the greatest investments we can make is, is, is to recognize that every one of us gathered around this room, we're just little pebbles. We're, we're little pebbles, but guess what? We stand on the unshakable cornerstone of Jesus the Christ who has promised to build his church. And what is he building his church with? Pebbles. He's taking all of the pebbles that we are, members of an un, unshakable kingdom, and together in one unified voice, we are being built up as a holy house, a remnant for his possession. And so we demonstrate to our next generation, this is what it looks like to live with unshakable faith in the midst of a world that's being shaken. Hebrews chapter 12 warns. The Lord warns us. There's, uh, um, here it is. Yet once more, he says, yet once more I will shake the heavens and the earth so that that which is unshakable may be seen. What is that all about? Well, the Lord is saying, I'm going to shake, I'm going to sift, and everything that's reliable in this world is going to be shaken and sifted, and people, yes, will fall away. But guess what? Underneath all of that, emerging forth will be an unshakable people who stand on an unshakable kingdom found in Jesus Christ. Invest in those little pebbles around you. Come alongside. There's a family in the church uh, who shared a testimony with me, shared with their permission, but I love this. It came in last week. They said, we have devoted ourselves to come alongside our children to actively help build a biblical worldview in our grandchildren. We have met with many grandchildren plus a growing number of additional children on a weekly basis for three and a half years that's awesome. New Hope, that's awesome. They're investing in little pebbles. And we have no intention of stopping until we die. Each week we worship, creatively tell a Bible story, plus a relevant modern day story and help them apply the truth to their lives. These kids have memorized countless Bible verses, heard hundreds of faith-building stories, and prayed for each other with heartfelt passion. Why am I reporting all this to you? It is not to boast I believe that lots of ministry such as this takes place behind the scenes in various locations, and I just thought you might be encouraged to know about the work going on in our tiny corner of God's vineyard. I am encouraged. And I'm encouraged every single time that one of you tells me about something that you're doing to invest in those little pebbles around you, because members of New Hope, we are, more importantly, members of an unshakable kingdom. And God, yes, he's in the sifting business. He's shaking us. But that sifting is good. Because in that sifting process, the Lord uses that pruning sifting to bring forth a holy remnant. And that's what we're called to be. A people for his glory. But the Lord does warn here, the destruction of Israel is gonna be caused by a sifting process Many fall, will fall away. Yes, the Lord will preserve a remnant. Now the question is this, okay? We're leaving verse 10. 
We're leaving verse 10. The question is this, what will become of Israel? What will become of Israel? If the Lord, in fact, does destroy them and they are exiled, which happened within 25 years of Amos' writing. Think of it. If they're gone and the Lord is destroyed, what is he going to do with that remnant? Will the Lord, in fact, be faithful? Somebody? Yes. There he goes. Let's try this again. Will the Lord, in fact, be faithful? Thank you, Dan. Verse 11, restoration of Israel. Here it is. Promises a new day. The Lord promises a new day. What will become of Israel? Take a look at it. Your passage is probably titled mine as, is as well. The restoration of Israel. The Lord makes three very specific promises of what he's going to do one day with the remnant. New Hope, listen. The promises that he makes here are going to be buried into the ground and they're going to lay dormant for 2,700 years. Whoa. Verse 11 and 12, here it is. He promises to do this. He promises to, uh, next, next slide. Uh, next one. A people, there we go. A people rebuilt. He promises in verse 11 that I'm going to take this people that has been exiled and I'm going to rebuild them. I'm going to repair them. I'm going to restore their cities. I'm going to take this people and I'm going to rebuild, restore, repair. And not just the people, verse 13 and 14, I'm going to take their land and I'm going to restore the blessings. Take a look at verse 13 and 14. It, when he talks about the richness of the agriculture and the beauty of, of as, the, as the, God restores the fortunes to this land that has been completely destroyed and vacated, the Lord says, I'm going to rebuild the people. I'm going to restore the blessings upon the land. Listen, he even uses imagery. What great poetic imagery. The hills are going to flow with wine. Oh, I hope it's a Cabernet Sauvignon, <laughs> right? Right. Just saying. But the hills are going to, what is that all about? It's richness. It's abundance. It's, it's flowing with the fortunes and the blessings of Almighty. But listen, even better, how does the passage end? The whole book ends with this. I'm going to replant them in their nation. Verse 15, let's take a look. Here's how it ends. The whole book of Amos ends on this glorious note of restoration and triumph. The Lord promises, I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Now, New Hope, just stop for a moment and consider that when Amos is prophesying this, within 25 years, Israel would be destroyed and taken captive, exiled to Assyria. History recounts it. We're not going to get into the details today. That promise of a people rebuilt, of blessings restored, and about people being replanted in the nation would lay dormant for about 2,700 years, during which time the Jewish people would be scattered abroad in about every nation you could imagine. And as they're scattered, the Lord is sifting them and shaking them and, and moving them. And, and, and this exiled remnant is being sifted and shaken and torn apart, oftentimes being opposed under hostility and cruelty and even opposition. For hundreds of years, listen, this nation of Israel would have to endure regime after regime. Next timeline. Uh, the timeline uh, shows it like this. They would endure Assyria and Babylon. Remember Daniel? They would endure Greece. They would endure the stranglehold of Rome who tried to crucify their savior. After the time of Christ, they would endure the Byzantines, the Islamic caliphates, the Mongols, the Ottomans, the British, more close to our time, the French, the Soviets, even the Nazis. All along that timeline, what is happening is that the world, the devil himself, is trying to oppose the very people of God to destroy Israel. But what he finds is that he's finding himself fighting against the very hand of God. And finally, out of the blue comes 1948 when a nation is reborn. The nation is reborn. Who, who, who could possibly do that except the sovereign hand of a God who causes one nation to fall and another nation to rise? My friend, 1948 is the fulfillment of Amos 9:15, Because the Lord said, I will again plant them in their land. And when I planted them in their land, never again will they be uprooted. Whoa, that's awesome. Well, I think it is. What this helps, what this helps 
is that as you look at the news, as you look at the shifting and sifting and shaking going on around our globe today, it should give you confidence that God knows what he's doing and he's in the business of fulfilling his promises. Here's the action step. The action step is this, interpret news with the Bible. And don't flip that around. Don't interpret your Bible with the news, please. Interpret the news with the Bible. Rest assured, God is directing the course of history to its glorious conclusion. The ultimate glorious conclusion is the day that Jesus Christ will raise up his church and he will have within his scarred hands, he will have the remnant, the people from every nation, tribe, tongue, and language who have called and professed upon Jesus Christ as Lord. Christ has promised to build his church. Until the time that he comes, he is in the shifting and sifting process. And one day he will completely sift and separate and shake out the wheat from the chaff, or the scripture would say the sheep from the goats. The scripture uses a bunch of language to testify and to point to the ultimate day of triumph when all of human history unfolds to the very final hour in which Christ Jesus returns and his church is victorious. Amos has been a book in which the lion has roared from Zion. It's a message for the ages. It was a message to the time of Israel, warning that trouble was ahead and they better wake up. It's a warning to the church today that trouble is brewing, trouble is ahead, it's time to wake up. God is in the sifting process right now. But listen, the path of growing is always accompanied by the process of sifting, which is why we welcome the sifting process because God knows what he's doing. Would you bow with me? Offer your hearts now to the Lord. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you run after us. Thank you that you pursue and chase and you offer that divine solution, seek me and live. And Father, for the unfolding plan that is revealed to us in the scripture of what you would do not only with Israel, but also with the church of Jesus. We thank you that you are faithful to every promise that you have ever made. I pray, Father, that we as a people, Lord, would rest assured knowing that you are sovereignly in charge of history and that it's moving towards its final glorious conclusion. And Father, until that day, I pray that the church would in fact remain strong. I pray now specifically for New Hope knowing that we are being sifted. Families are being sifted. Children, grandchildren are being sifted. And there's, there's some tumultuousness that we feel. And Father, I pray that you would wake up the sleepy church, that you would perfect a corrupt church, that you would continue to draw forth a holy remnant for your glorious possession. Thank you, Lord, that you're faithful. Thank you, Lord, that Amos has roared loud and clear. And may this message continue to go forth into our generation. Thank you for being so faithful and good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Well, thank you, New Hope, and all of you in the online community. We are so thankful for your partnership, your co-laboring in the gospel message, whether you're watching from Michigan or Ohio, West Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, or all across uh, other places in the United States. Thank you for your continued faithfulness in the Lord. And I'm Craig Trueather, your pastor, reminding you that you are loved.